last U.S. soldier leaving Afghanistan after the country fell to the Taliban once again. This was reminiscent of another image, an artist's representation of the only survivor of the first Anglo-Afghan war when the British army was wiped out there. Author and historian William Dalrymple, who has written one of the most authoritative books on Afghanistan and the British campaign there, Return of a King, gives us his take on how history has repeated itself once again in Afghanistan. Yes, I predicted what was very obvious to any historian, that uh, uh, an occupation uh, by foreign troops in Afghanistan uh, is, is not likely to be a success, that it's... Uh, uh, there is a long history of foreign forces um, being kicked out of, uh, of Afghanistan. I've just, funny enough, this morning in the research for my next book, was reading about the fall of Iconum, which was the um, Bactrian Greek uh, settlement with theatres and all the um, paraphernalia of a colonial Greek settlement falling to the Kushans and the Huns in 145. 145 BC. Um, and so from that point onward, um, many foreign, in, uh, uh, particularly European invaders who have tried to impose their will in Afghanistan have left uh, after the Greeks. Um, I mean, it was all well, settled at modern times. Uh, the first Afghan war, which is what I was writing about in The Return of a King, which was the East India Company's attempts to uh, open up Afghanistan to trade and to increase their profitability in that in, in Central Asia. And uh, uh, after that, the Raj uh, with the second uh, uh, Afghan war, uh, a third stalemate in 1919, which the British called the third uh, Anglo-Afghan war, then the Russians and now the Americans. But had, you know, there the were ways around it and, and Karzai um, played a very, very clever game because while he was taking American aid, and taking American weaponry, he went out of his way, especially after he read Return of the King, to distance himself from the Americans. He attacked them very publicly. Famously, Joe Biden walked out of a dinner uh, in Kabul uh, that Karzai gave, uh, which was a huge diplomatic uh, tiff at the time, uh, and may lie in the background of, of, of this current uh, affair. And um, Karzai was very good at creating a big t tent uh, which is what you have to do in Afghanistan. You have to bring in all the different tribal groups and the different tribal elders. And I saw myself how he would greet, you know, these very old men coming in from some distant corner of the country with four or five of their tribesmen or, or clansmen. Uh, and he would touch their feet and invite them in and sit down on a carpet with them and, uh, and, and be enormously welcome. But Ashraf Ghani, who was his successor, uh, also a very clever friend, uh, a clever man and, uh, someone who helped me enormously research this book. Many of the primary sources that I used were first uh, pointed out to me by Ashraf Ghani. Uh, Ghani was always the kind of Columbia professor. Uh, he, was, he was very westernized. He didn't suffer fools gladly. He had a very short temper. He famously threw an ashtray at one female journalist at his first press conference. Uh, and um, when these tribal leaders came in, he would say, you've got 10 minutes. Now, that's not the way you speak to, uh, you know, the, the leader of, uh, sort of the, the, the Achaksai coming in from Uruzgan or Wardak or somewhere uh, when he's just trekked across the country and risked his life through Taliban checkpoints and things uh, to come and see you. And, and, and he also had this habit, which many people described to me very disconcertingly, of, of, of doing that Western thing of taking his shoes off and putting his feet up during audiences and pointing his feet towards so, which is, you know, is, you know, in India, as in Afghanistan, as in Iran or the Arab world, is an insulting thing to do. If you point the soles of your feet at someone, that's like telling them to piss off. Um, and he would do this. He had this stool that was carried around wherever he was sitting. Like, when he was sitting, he had a favorite chinar tree out the, uh, outside the Arg in Kabul, where he used to sit. And he, had, and he had it brought down. And then if you saw him in the evening, he had it upstairs. Uh, and all these things cumulatively meant that he, he was perceived very strongly as the West man. He talked with an American accent uh, and um, he hadn't really lived in Afghanistan as an adult for a long time until 2001. He'd been largely in, in New York and, uh, and Washington. And as a result, as we've seen, no one really was prepared to die for it. 
uh, everyone in the end came to an accommodation with the Taliban, right. even though they right. may not like the Taliban. Or... Ra rather ironical, given that he was an anthropologist by training and one would think he would have and some sex. But, but tell me, I mean, you have, uh, you know, uh, when you draw parallels between what happened uh, in uh, the first Anglo-Afghan war and what happened during Karzai's time, you drew some fantastic parallels also in the kind of tribal equations that persist even today. So both, uh, um, uh, you know, Karzai and Ghani are actually of the Sadozai uh, tribe, which, no, which you point uh, out. No, not Ghani. Uh, oh, okay. No, so so Karzai and uh, Mullah Omar was from the rival uh, camp. So tell us yeah. how, you know, uh, these car, the clan equations have panned out because you had the great game uh, also where the European powers stirred the pot, so to say, quite effectively. Uh, and, you know, it's really been an area of conflict of uh, diverse interest groups coming and pulling and pushing apart. So it's really um, a crucible of a lot of violence and naturally so because of what has happened over there over the last 150, 170 years, uh, like you put it. Now, um, how much of that stands today as a Taliban comes in? How is this Taliban different from the last time the Taliban marched in? What, what are your fears right now? So several questions there. That's an elevator question. So let me take them one by one. First of all, the tribal question. Um, yes, that Karzai is the chief of the Popozai tribe and is the great, great grandson or great, great, great grandson of Shah Shujur mulk who was the Sadazai monarch who was expelled from Afghanistan, who the British brought back as their puppet in 1839. So in other words, we put the same guy on twice, once in the Victorian period, once with the Americans in 2001. The leading tribe during the retreat from Kabul who massacred the British on their way south from Kabul in the passes were the Gilzai. Now the Gilzai are the opposite end of the social scale in Afghanistan. If the Popolzai and the Sadazai are the are the grand monarchs and the uh, the landlords and the uh, the aristocrats? The Gilzai are the dispossessed, the nomads, the herdsmen, um, the day laborers. And just as it was the Gilzai who brought uh, who who massacred the British in the passes in January 1842, so the Gilzai are the uh, are the foot soldiers of the Taliban. And Mullah Omar is a Hotaki Gilzai, uh, in, and who are the famously puritanical now for Indians, for interesting because. Uh, the, uh, the Hotaki Gilzai was, were strong allies of Aurangzeb, who had this very hardline brand of Islam. Uh, and he allied against the uh, decadent Persians in, in his, his period. Uh, in, 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 and, and the Gilzai. So imagine, you know, they are the kind of guys that Aurangzeb loved to get on with. <laughs> so in, in 1842, again, they are the guys who bring down the British, very conservative, rural, do not like outsiders. They do the massacres in 1842. Today, they are the puritanical, conservative, uh, rural uh, laborers who make up the foot soldiers of the Taliban. Catch my full conversation with William Dalrymple only on LHI Circle. Subscribe now.